voice modulator activated. The content of this meaning is being sent to a third party. I wonder what that means. Got it. Welcome, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Welcome, uh, Zion or Bus community. Uh, we are uh, members of the Zion or Bus community today, and um, I'm Micah from the two, and uh, me and my wife, Ashley. And today we're going to be doing a talk breakdown this Sunday of Wilford Woodruff, the saints hold the keys of salvation for all Israel. So sorry for being a little late today. Um, the whole family sick again, except for me, the last man standing again. And so uh, obviously we're late because <laughs> I'm running things <laughs> and I am not as effective at, any, at anything. Okay, but welcome. Uh, and man, this is a, this was a, a fun one. Uh, I think the first couple paragraphs i was a little bit worried because like i don't remember this one but then as it got going i was like wow this is this has got some golden quotes in it so i'm glad i really glad i kept kept reading so really glad i kept reading i had i did all this myself today so if this is horrible don't blame ashley so uh without further ado so this talk is uh by uh wilford woodruff uh journal discourses 1815 um, the Resurrection, Laying the Cornerstone of the Temple in Jackson County, uh, Mission of the Twelve Apostles, Baptism of Nearly 600 of the United Brethren, The Saints Hold the Keys of Salvation for All Israel, Judgments Await the Wicked Folly of the Fashions. Um, as as always with these Journal of Discourses, the, the reason why the, the name is like this is because they didn't name their talks, right? They just stood up and... and spoke um as the spirit dictated and so there wasn't actually a name for a talk right it was typically just journal of discourses 1830 so this was just a, a discourse given by wilford woodruff and then later it was like well what generally did he talk about and so like the this is a list of of the topics he hit starting at the beginning and going to the end so if you're wondering why these these names are so long that's the reason for it um we have, I th have we reached the end of the, the conference talks for this last conference? So, so, so next week for Easter is the last conference talk that we're going to be breaking down from last conference. As always, we break down like two, three, four uh, conference talks from last conference, and then we'll mix in an older one, right? And so we believe there's great value in that, and there's great value in this. And uh, I get, I get uh, something. And I know this is going to offend a lot of people, but I just don't really care because I'm speaking from my personal experience. I get something personal um, from reading these old conference talks that I just don't get from reading um, and uh, new conference talks. There is something I get for me in them that that I, I don't get in the new conference talks. And so there's reading the new conference talks and 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 and, and paying attention to them, but also reading these old ones is is a great way for me to stay sane and to to stay grounded and to to um to to build that foundation so i i love doing these so without further ado we have uh our talk breakdown and once again so what we'll do ashley and i is we'll we'll read the talk the talks in black and i will put my words in orange i tried to put in orange for some reason the orange wasn't working so good today so it's more like a weird orange and then uh, then we'll go back and forth between the talk and our words. And then when we're done, um, members of the Zion Bus community, I believe um, Antonia and Sheila were uh, going to share with us some things that they um, felt prompted and, and learned as they studied this talk as well. So here we go. So Wilfred Woodruff, Journal Discourses 1815. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? Everyone can hear me. You can see, right? I didn't even check. Everyone's waving. No one says I can't hear. That's good. The sting of death is sin. And the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This doctrine of the resurrection of the dead is most glorious. It is comforting, at least to my spirit, to think that in the morning of the resurrection, my spirit will have the privilege of dwelling in the very same body that it occupied here. As elders of Israel, we have traveled a great many thousand miles in the weariness and fatigue, laboring to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to the children of men. I would be very glad to have the same body in the resurrection with which I waded swamps, swam rivers, and traveled and labored to build up the kingdom of God here on the earth. I like this. I rejoice in the privilege we enjoy at this conference of meeting with so many Latter-day Saints 
I feel that we have had a good deal of the Spirit of the Lord with us, and I hope that it may continue until we get through with the conference. President Young referred yesterday in his remarks to the experience of some of us in the past days. I have reflected a good deal upon these things as well as on the future. I have long been associated with the kingdom of God, and I wish to refer for a moment to what was said yesterday on, the sub on that subject. The mission then mentioned was one of much interest to the Twelve, if not to the Church. The whole of that mission to England from the beginning to the end placed the apostles in such a position that they had to walk by faith from first to last. The Lord gave a revelation with date, day, month, and year when they were to go up to lay the cornerstone in Caldwell County, far west Missouri. When that revelation was given, all was peace and quietude comparatively in the land. But when the time came for the twelve apostles to fulfill that revelation, the saints had all been driven out by the exterminating order of Governor Boggs, and it was as much as a man's life was worth, especially one of the twelve, to be found in that state. And when the day came on which we were commanded by the Lord in that revelation to go up and lay the cornerstone of that temple, and there take the parting, uh, parting hand with the saints— to cross the waters to preach the gospel in England. The inhabitants of Missouri had sworn that if all the revelations of old Joe Smith were fulfilled, that should not be, because it had a day and a date to it. President Young asked the 12 who were with him, what shall we do with regard to fulfillment of this revelation? He wanted to know their feelings. Father Smith, the patriarch, said the Lord would take the will for the deed. Others said the Lord could not expect the 12 apostles to go up and sacrifice their lives to fulfill that revelation. But the Spirit of the Lord rested upon the 12, and they said, The Lord God has spoken, and we will fulfill that revelation and commandment. And that was the feeling of President Young and of those who were with him. And I put I put some uh, parts of, of the original talk in, in yellow gold, um, so I forgot that I'd done that, so... Um, these are the parts of the talk that really my, my mind was drawn to and I wanted to comment on and uh, were gold quotes. Okay. So now we're getting into my additions. Now reading these old talks, there's always a few things that come up in my mind and heart. Um, and, uh, as, 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 as I read these old talks, you know, what, one of the things is the, the literal fulfillment of everything. I absolutely love how they're, they're always talking about the literal fulfillment of everything, the sacrifice um, just, you know, wading through bogs and, and so forth. Like th there's so many things that come in my heart and my mind that, that I just love reading about. And I feel connected to them. Um, the one that comes up here, however, is the, we're no different today. And if we are, we're only worse. Like I read these talks, you know, given in the 1800s. And I think how, how are we not any better as saints today? Like, how is this exactly the same as us today like how have we not gotten better at all like don't we learn from the past um then i asked the question don't we have these same three groups today right as we do in any day so i bet you if you went back to the you know moses and the children of israel there was these same three groups right it's it, it seems to be these same three groups of people and varying degrees in them right there's the the majority then there's a smaller majority and then there's the few Right. It's always it's always that way. Right. So what's the first group? The Lord only requires a heart or desire. So our actions don't matter. Right. The Lord, the, the Lord will count that as the deed. And mind you, that one actually came from Father Smith. OK, um, this typical watering down seems to come from the old heads trying not to rock any boats, trying desperately just to die before their children or grandchildren go inactive or worse, they go anti, or worse, they don't get to experience their wealth right before they die. That's another one that's pretty common today. No, no, your heart and desire is enough, right? Don't worry about your actions. When, when they say that, they mean your failures. Just stay active, right? Just stay, just stay. All is well. The all is well chapters in the Book of Mormon, as well as the We Are Saved by Grace, after all we can do, put this group to bed, right? This is This is not enough or exaltation. We have to get better than this. Second group is, no one is expected to personally sacrifice or act to bring about the fulfillment of prophecy. That's the second group, okay? This typical apathetic member is mostly around for the smooth sailing. They live, right, in their $3.5 million homes, 
fully expect to avoid all the hard trials and difficulties and sacrifices and simply, when the time comes, trade in their estates for properties in Zion in the Celestial Kingdom. This group is marked by their refusal to act until the prophet says something or a powerful enough spiritual experience happens, right? Because some people will say, I won't do anything when the prophet says something. Other groups will not listen even if the prophet says something. They have to have that personal spiritual experience before they'll act as well, right? Some will say, I'd do it if the prophet asked. Others would say, I'd do it if the Holy Ghost told me to. But looking at the prophecies of God to them in whole in the holy word of God, right? They feel no personal responsibility to act for themselves to bring them into being. Dr. Evans 58 puts these or people in this group to bed. For behold, it is not meet that I should command in all things. For he that is compelled in all things, the same as a slothful and not wise servant, wherefore he receiveth no reward. That's important. It's not a lesser reward in, in the celestial kingdom. No, people in this condition actually receive no reward. Verily I say, men should be anxiously engaged in a good cause and do many things of their own free will and bring to pass much righteousness. Meaning they read the revelations of God. They read what, what's supposed to happen and they do everything they can to bring their life in line with that as they move forward. For the power is in them wherein they are agents unto themselves, and inasmuch as men do good, they shall in no wise lose their reward. But he that doeth not anything until he is commanded. Uh, I'm not going to do it unless the prophet tells me or personal revelation tells me, right? I'm not going to do it. And then receiveth the commandment with doubtful heart. Well, I don't know if that first presidency letter really means what I think it means. I don't think I actually have to do it, right? And then keeps it with slothfulness or not at all. The same is damned. Who am I that made man say the Lord that will hold him guiltless that obeys not my commandments? Who am I say the Lord that have promised and have not fulfilled, which is exactly what we're talking about here in this context, right? I command and men obey not. I revoke and they receive not the blessings. Then they say in their hearts, this is not the work of the Lord for his promises are not fulfilled. But woe unto such for their reward lurketh beneath and not from above, right? You were not in the right group, okay? And then there's this third group. Finally, this is the last and final group. This is the few. This is the, I will go and do what the Lord hath commanded group. It's just as simple as that. This is the most literal and childlike, what we're supposed to be. This is the celestial group, okay? No self-justification or rationalization required. First Nephi 3.7. It really is that simple. So let's get her done group, right? That's this group. And I asked the question, once again, are we any different today? Are we any different from Nephi, Sam, and Laban and Lemuel? Not really. If, if anything, we simply slide comfortably into the muddy river of atrophy, humming, look for the bare necessities, the simple bare necessities. Forget about your worries and your strife. All is well in Zion, yea, Zion prospers. We went through that stake and we laid that cornerstone. George A. Smith and myself were ordained to the apostleship on that cornerstone upon that day. We returned in safety and not a dog to move his tongue and no man shed our blood. As soon as we got home, we prepared ourselves to go to our mission to England. And as President Young has said, the devil undertook to kill us. I have myself been in Tennessee and Kentucky for two or three years, where in the fall there was not well persons enough to take care of the sick during the ague months. And yet, I never had the ague. Is that a pronounce again? Ague. I knew I was wrong. Ague in my life until called to go upon the mission to England. There was not one solitary soul in the Quorum of Twelve, but what the devil undertook to destroy. And as was said yesterday, when Brother Taylor and myself, the first two of the Quorum ready for the trip, were on hand to start, I was shaking with the ague. And I had it every other day. And on my well day, when I did not have it, my wife had it. I got up and laid my hands upon her and blessed her and blessed my child, having only one at the time. And I started across the river. And that man who sits behind me today, the president of the church and kingdom of God upon the earth, paddled me across the Missouri River in a canoe. And that is the way I landed in Nauvoo. I lay down on the side of a soul 
side of Soul Leather by the old post office, and I did not know where to go. And I was not able to stand on my feet. And I lay down there. By and by, the prophet came along and said, he, Brother Woodruff, you are going on your mission? Yes, I said. But I feel more like a subject for the dissecting room than for a mission. He reproved me for what I said and told me to get up and go. Brother Taylor, the only member of the Quorum of the Twelve who was well, and I traveled together. And on the way, he fell to the ground as though he had been knocked on the head with an axe. Old Father, Father Colton was carrying us, and Brother Taylor fell twice in that way, taken with the bilious fever, and no man in that quorum could boast that he went on that mission without feeling the hand of the destroyer, for it was laid upon us all. I had the shaking ague and lay on my back in a wagon and was rolled over stumps and stones until it seemed as if my life would be shaken out of me. I left Brother Taylor behind by his advice, for said he, we are both sick, and if you stay, you can't do anything here. So old Father Colton carried me along in his wagon until I got to Buffalo, New York. From there, I traveled alone to Farmington, Con Connecticut, my native place, and I stayed there 15 days at my father's house, coughing and shaking every day. My father never expected that I should leave my bed, and my stepmother did not expect that I should ever get better. A message came from an uncle of mine who had just died, and his last words were, I want you to send for a friend, friend Wilford. I want him to come and preach my funeral sermon. My, f my father said, you can't go and preach that sermon, for you can't sit up in your bed, said I. Never mind. Get up your horse and wagon. And he did so, and I got into it and rode over th that morning in a chilly wind. And the hour that my ague was coming on, I got before a big blazing fire and preached the funeral sermon of my friend and the ague left me from that day and i went back and went on my way rejoicing in the process of time brother taylor came along and he and i crossed the ocean together and arrived in england and here i want to make a little statement of my experience in those days concerning circumstances that took place with me when brother brigham left home he told you that all his family had once had all his family had was one barrel of rotten flour. 200 cents would have bought every pound of provision I left with my family when I left home. And this is what's important here. So people say what? People always say what? Well, people have to take care of their families, right, Micah? People have to take care of their families. They have their families to feed. Well, what did Brother Brigham and what did um, uh, Brother Woodruff have for their families at this time? Nothing. Rotten flour, that's what they had. And yet... This is what he says. This is gold. But we left our wives for we had the commandment of God upon us and we were either going to obey it or die trying. That was the spirit of the elders of Israel. And then later on, he says something else. So pay close attention to this. Now, at this moment, I wrote something down here in my mind when reading through this talk. And the feeling I got when reading these words were echoed by Woodruff later. So I actually felt something. And then Woodruff actually said exactly what I was thinking later. Where are the sons of the prophets? That's what I thought. Where are they today? Where are these people like this today? I fear the answer today, to my heart, is not the same as the answer Woodruff got for his day. The facts remain, we can't even get seniors in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to go on comfy senior missions with their spouses. The age of obeying or die trying, we couldn't even get people to do their home teaching monthly. No death, simply home visit. So instead, we decided to eliminate the monthly requirement, change the name, and called it an improvement. No, Ephraim is drunk on Babylon, and I don't find these people willing to be obedient or die trying. We support priestcraft, which preaches, do this and there is no harm. Do that and there is no sin, just as they did of old and just as it was prophesied that we would. I long to be around such dedicated saints, saints that inspire me, saints that, yes, even make me feel guilty and make me want to improve and become more. But I'm here with the donut refreshments or after the event priesthood. Judgy? Yes, I am judging men of the caliber of Woodruff to be a class above the Donut Refreshment Brigade. 
Come at me. He continues. And I blessed my wife and child and left them in the hands of God and to the tender mercies of our noble bishops and those who were acquainted with them know how it was in those days. However, I went on my way and I want to speak of a little circumstance. I a little circumstance. I had with me an old clock, which I got in Tennessee when traveling with Brother Smoot over 40 years ago. It had once been a dandy clock and had and had on keg buttons. Cloak. Cloak. I was going to say it was because it was a it was a coat later on. He took off the buttons and when new and when new had a good deal of trimming and fancy work about it. But it was then pretty well threadbare and worn out. I wore it in Kirtland and I carried it to England with me. And when I was called by revelation to go to John Ben Bowes and preach the gospel, I wore that cloak. I went there and found over 600 people called United Brethren. And among them were 83 preachers, and they, as a people, were prepared for the word of the Lord, and I wanted to catch them in the gospel's net. Before embracing the doctrine of the United Brethren, Sister Benbow had been what is called a lady in England, and she had worn her, her silks and satins. But after obeying the doctrine of this religious body, she cut up and burned and destroyed her silks and satins and wore the plainest and calicos she could get because she thought that was religion. When I went there to preach, she looked at me with this old cloak with the, the keg buttons on, and the Spirit of the Lord bore testimony to me that religion, so far as she was concerned, had a good deal of tradition about it, and that her faith could be tried by the coat a man wore. And as Paul said, if eating meat offended his brethren, he would never eat any more. So I felt a good deal, and one morning I went out and cut off the buttons from my old cloak and never had a button on it afterwards. By doing this and some other things, which some perhaps would call foolish, I, through the blessings of God and with the assistance of Brother Young, George A. Smith, and Willard Richards, caught the whole flock and baptized every soul except one solitary person into the church and kingdom of God. Once again, this is a perfect example, like a Paul taught of, of teaching rapport and, and also of your, your example. If they think you of a, as a preacher, if they think something of you, um, it can it can determine an awful lot. Many of them are here in this room today, and some of them have passed away. I mentioned this to show our position. And what was the position? That he had no food. His family had nothing. Rotten flour, right? And they still left. And even then, he cut the buttons off of his jacket so that, that his old jacket, just so that he would not appear a certain way. And then he says this, this is the really crucial part. We traveled without purse and script and we preached without money and without price. Why? Because the God of heaven had called upon us to go forth and warn the world. Okay. Once again, a clear understanding and definition of priestcraft. We preached without money and without price. Now, where have I heard this before? Second Nephi 26, he doeth not anything. This is speaking of Christ. Save it be for the benefit of the world, for he loveth the world, even that he layeth down his own life, that he may draw all men unto him. Wherefore, he commandeth that none, he commandeth none that they shall not partake of his salvation. Behold, does he cry unto any, saying, Depart from me? Behold, I say unto you, Nay. But he saith, Come unto me, all ye ends of the earth, buy milk and honey without buy milk and honey without money and without price. And then he asks, and then Wilfred would have asked the following: Why? Well, because the God of heaven had called us or commanded us to go forth and warn the world. Now, where have I heard this before? And I guess I could, you should also ask, is this just for the apostles? No, it becometh every man who has been warned to warn his neighbor. That's the command of Doctrine and Covenants. But let's read in Doctrine and Covenants 26. Let's keep going. Hath he, the Lord, commanded any that they should not partake of his salvation? Behold, they say unto you, nay, but he hath commanded it, it. He has given it free for all men. And here's the kicker. And he hath commanded his people that that they should persuade all men to repentance. 
He didn't. He hasn't commanded the apostles. He hasn't commanded the prophet. He hasn't commanded people with special callings. No, the Lord has commanded those that would claim to be his people, those that desire to take upon him his name. He has commanded them to follow him and do the same and persuade all men to repentance. Okay, In the same way the Lord uh, did it. He commanded that there shall be no priestcrafts. So you do it like I did it, not like this. For behold, priestcrafts are that men preach and set themselves up for a light unto the world that they may get gain and praise of the world, but they seek not the welfare of Zion. But behold, the Lord has forbidden this thing, wherefore the Lord God hath given a commandment that all men should have charity, which charity is love. And except they should have charity, they were nothing. Wherefore, if they if they should have charity, they would not suffer the laborer in Zion to perish. But the laborer in Zion shall labor for Zion, for if they labor for money, they shall perish. It's almost like this was commonly taught and understood for the first, oh, I don't know, 100 plus years of the church's restoration. Continuing, and here's the question that I was shocked to find Wolford ask as well, because this was exactly the question I had in my heart. He says, now I want to say again, I've looked around within the last few years and I have thought, where, oh, where are the sons of the prophets, apostles, and fathers in Zion preparing in these last days to rise up and bear off this kingdom when we are on the other side of the veil? Sometimes in thinking on this subject, I have felt that they were very few and far between who had the spirit of their fathers and were prepared to bear off this kingdom. But I thank God that I find it is now something like it was in the days of Elijah, when the prophet said, referring to the followers of Baal, they have killed thy prophets and pulled down thine altars, and I alone am left. The Lord said, oh no, I have 7,000 men in Israel who have not yet bowed the knee to Baal. Well, I begin to feel since I have heard the testimonies of our young brethren at this conference that some of the sons of the servants of God are become are becoming filled, some of the sons of the servants of God are becoming filled with the fire and spirit of the prophets. We want a good many of them to rise up and bear off this kingdom. Man, I really hope, I, I just read that again, man. I just really hope that there, that there are some people left, some people left in Zion or Bus, man. You know, it's like 2020 with the desolating sickness. There seem to be a bunch of people interested in this kind of, you know, stuff. And it's weighing down. And I feel like, I feel like, uh, you know, this seems like a, a Gimli moment, right? Like this is a, there's one dwarf left, you know, that, that breathes, you know, like, is, is it going to come down to this, you know, where there's 7,000 people left? There's, there's just a few thousand men left that say, I will not bow the knee. I will not, I will not um, forsake the olive trees. I will not forsake the tower. I, I will have faith in the prophecies of God. Um, I, I hope that I hope that if a, if the prophet of God today asks such a question today, if President Nelson knelt down and said, "Where are these people that that are going to do this?" You know, I hope that my face and the faces of of the Zioner bus come to his mind. I hope that. I hope that we're among those people that the Lord says, no, there are the few that still fear my name and that think upon me. Now, I just want to say here at this time, all these subjects that he's talking about here really all tie, tie together really, really well. He's going to go into the oil and the lamps. He's going to go into being prepared, etc. And that's all being tied to temporal. Now, that's really important. And we're going to get into the, more into that as we continue. So there's a lump of subjects that are all connected, but that also is tied directly to the other thing that he's going into here, which is the bearing off the kingdom and and that being tied directly to the end, right? The wrapping up scene or the Lord cutting short his work in righteousness is another way this is worded, which the Lord does when the cup of iniquity is full, right? The cup of iniquity is full when the balance of power in the church is lost as President uh, Young taught. So President Young taught there's a principle which I would like to have the Latter-day Saints perfectly understand, that is, of blessings and cursings. For instance, we read that war, pestilence, plagues, famine, etc. will be visited upon the inhabitants of the earth, 
But if distress through the judgments of God comes upon this people, meaning the saints, it will be because the majority have turned away from the Lord. Let the majority of the people turn away from the holy commandments, which the Lord has delivered to us and cease to hold the balance of power in the church. Okay. How about some simple commandments here, right? Man marries woman, follow the prophet. How about those two commandments alone? Pretty high on the top of the list, right? And we may expect the judgments of, of God to come upon us. But while six tenths, now that's 60%, or three fourths, that's 75%, of this people will keep the commandments of God, the curse and judgments of the Almighty will never come upon them though we will have trials of various kinds and the elements to contend with natural and spiritual elements. So, so long as 60 to 75% still obey the commandments. How about just these two, follow the prophet and the family proclamation. Found the proclamation, we read. We warn the individuals who violate covenants of chastity, who abuse spouse or offspring or who fail to fulfill family responsibilities will one day stand accountable before God. Further, we warn that the disintegration of the family will bring upon individuals, communities, and nations the calamities foretold by ancient and modern prophets. End quote. So ancient and modern prophets, it's like President Young here, these calamities that we're talking about here will be brought about when 60 when we no longer have 60 to 75% of the membership of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints support the family proclamation. Okay. And I don't, and uh, I'll let people decide where we're at with that one, but people should know where I'm at with that one, where we are. This topic will come up again as we continue. So I'll save the other half of the quotes till then. Um, but once again, understand all these topics are connected. Now I want to say a word or two on another subject. Uh, Wilford continues. I have heard some of our brethren remark, if the twelve apostles have the word of the Lord, we would like to receive it. I want to say a few words with regard to the word of the Lord. I think that many of these people are mistaken with regard to the word of the Lord, as though a president of the church has to say, thus saith the Lord before it becomes the word of the Lord. Almost like we haven't changed or learned anything in a couple hundred years. Okay? They say they sometimes wonder why President Young does not give them the word of the Lord. I've been acquainted with President Young more than 40 years. It is over 40 years since I traveled a thousand miles with him. Joseph Smith, Orson Hyde, Orson Pratt, Charles C. Rich, and many others, perhaps in this congregation. And I never saw a day from that day until the present, but what President Brigham Young, even before the 12 apostles were organized, always had the word of the Lord for the people. And instead of thinking there is no word of the Lord, my faith is that there is not an elder in Israel who has any business to preach unless he has the word of the Lord of the people. The 12 apostles should have the word of the Lord of the people. The high priesthood should have the word of the Lord to the people. These 4,070s, the messengers of Israel to the nations of the earth, should have the word of the Lord of the people. Should all be on the ground of the pyramid of truth, right? And every elder of Israel, when he speaks, should have the word of the Lord and the whole church and kingdom of God, men and women, should have each for himself and herself the testimony of Jesus Christ, which is the spirit of prophecy. This should be in the possession of every man and woman in the church for their own government and guidance. And this has always been the teaching to us of President Brigham Young. And this is backed up by the revelations which the Lord has given in these last days. Oh, but Micah, I've heard you say in the past, the spirit of prophecy is to have a knowledge and testimony of the macro last day timeline, those events. Here it says that the spirit of prophecy is to have a testimony of Jesus Christ. Which is it? Both. And to ask the question here would be to fail to understand the entire context of Wolf or Woodruff's entire talk. What does it mean to have a testimony of Jesus Christ? What does it actually mean? Well, it means to know that he was born, suffered, and died for my sins. And what does that knowledge bring you? Huh? Knowing that, what do you gain? Will that knowledge give you anything or provide anything for you? Well, I will know he is my savior. You can know he can be your savior. There's a huge difference there. Joseph Smith taught, the ancient saints obtained promises 
Okay. From the teaching of the prophet Joseph Smith. Most assuredly it is, however, that the ancients through, uh, though persecuted and afflicted by men, obtain from God promises of such weight and glory that our hearts are often filled with gratitude, that we are even permitted to look upon them while we contemplate that there is no respect of persons in his sight. And that in every nation, he that feareth God and worketh righteousness is acceptable with him. But from the few items previously quoted, we can draw the conclusion that there is to be a day when all will be judged of their works and rewarded according to the same. That those who have kept the faith will be crowned with a crown of righteousness to be clothed in white raiment, be admitted to the marriage feast, be free from every affliction and reign with Christ on the earth. Where, according to the ancient promise, they will partake of the fruit of the vine new in the glorious kingdom with him. At least we find that such promises were made to the ancient saints. And though we cannot claim these promises which were made to the ancients, for they are not our property, merely because they were made to the ancient saints, yet if we are the children of the Most High and are called with the same calling with which they, the ancient saints, were called and embraced the same covenant that the ancient saints embraced, that they embraced, and are faithful to the testimony of our Lord. Just having faith, what he's teaching here is having faith as the brother of Jared. As they were, we can approach the Father in the name of Christ as they approached him. That's exactly what having faith as the brother Jared means. That is exactly what it means. And for ourselves, obtain the same promises. These promises, when obtained, if ever by us, will not be because Peter, John, and the other apostles with the churches at Sardis, per Pergamos, Philadelphia, and elsewhere walked in the fear of God and had power and faith to prevail and obtain them or became Israel, right? Let God prevail. But it will be because we ourselves have faith and approach God in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, even as they did. We need to have faith as the brother Jared, okay? And when these promises are obtained, they will be promises directly to us or they will do us no good. Simply knowing these things about this, the past history lesson, even knowing that the, the, the Lord is Savior does us no good. It's not a personal promise to us. They will be communicated for our benefit, being our own property through the gift of God earned by our own diligence in keeping his commandments and walking uprightly before him. If not to what end serves the gospel of our Lord, uh, our gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And why was it ever communicated to us? End quote from the prophet Joseph Smith. To have a testimony of the savior, a real testimony, one must have a perfect idea of God's attributes and char characteristics, and then know that his life is acceptable before the Lord. It's all taught in the lectures on faith and um, subsequently in the, the quote that I just read. And central to that is knowing that the promises of the Lord are sure. And what is the macro last day timeline? But a knowledge that what the Lord has promised, he will literally fulfill. Which is exactly how this talk started and the direction it is taking. Right? We know that the Lord's promises will be fulfilled. One cannot separate a real testimony of Christ away from the promises made by Christ to the house of Israel or the personal promises Christ has made to the faithful of all ages, as Joseph Smith went over above. And one cannot separate a true understanding of the macro last day timeline away from the exact same things. The promises made by Christ to the house of Israel, et cetera, et cetera, they are the same. Wilford continues. You will find if you read the 22nd section of the book of Doctrine and Covenants, that revelation was given over 40 years ago to elders Orson Hyde, Luke Johnson, Lyman Johnson, and W.E. McClellan. And on that occasion, the Lord said, go forth and preach the gospel to the people. When you go forth, you are called to teach the people and not to be taught. And you must teach as you are moved upon by the Holy Ghost, by the power of God and by the spirit of the Lord. And when you speak as you are moved upon by the spirit of the Lord, your words are scripture. 
They are the word of the Lord. They are the mind of the Lord. They are the will of the Lord and the power of God and the salvation unto every one that hears. Yes, we have plenty of testimony with regard to these things. And I will say to my brethren that whatever the word of the Lord may be to them, I know what the word of the Lord is to me. The word of the Lord to me is that it is time for Zion to rise and let our light shine. And the testimony of the Spirit of God to me is that this whole kingdom, this great kingdom of priests, this 40,000 men in these mountains of Israel who have borne the priesthood, have thoroughly fulfilled one part of the parable of the ten virgins. What is that? Why? That while the bridegroom has tarried, we have all slumbered and slept. Once again, confirming where they were starting to enter into in the parable of the nobleman's olive trees as well. As a church and kingdom, we have slumbered and slept. And the word of the Lord to me is that we have slept long enough. And we have the privilege now of rising and trimming our lamps and putting oil in our vessels. This is the word of the Lord to me. The word of the Lord to me again is that it is time for this whole people, these 40,000 elders of Israel who dwell these valleys of these mountains. And I believe that it is the word of the Lord to them that we listen to the voice of the Lord through the lawgiver and unite ourselves in temporal things. And that we labor to build up the kingdom of God and cease to labor to build up ourselves alone against the interests of the kingdom of God. This is the word of the Lord to me, and I think it is to you. Once again, the tie back to temporal things and the call to stop laboring to build up ourselves alone. That is a direct tie-in. Once again, to what we just went over above in 2 Nephi 26, you know, laboring to build yourself up or laboring for Zion, this constant drumbeat of the temporal things is actually crucial to not overlook. As we get further into the oil we are supposed to obtain and hold, the holding of temporal things shows everything we need to know about a person. Someday people will see that as clearly as a lamp lit up bright and burning with oil versus someone holding an empty lamp standing in the dark. Someone holding millions of dollars in estates, fancy clothing, Ford Broncos, etc. Shows people where that person's heart was at. Likewise, someone holding onto wheat and calmly, calmly clothes will show people where that person's heart was at. People want to say, spiritual is more important, like the two are separate. Like screaming, the motives and desire are the most important things. Our actions are a reflection of of our motives and dires, uh, desires. So as a man thinketh, a man doeth. Our temporal surroundings are a reflection of our spiritual. The words of the Lord continue to reinforce this idea over and over and over again, and we would not. You cannot serve both God and mammon. If you serve God, your temporal will, will reflect that. If you serve mammon, your temporal will reflect that, period. Wilford continues, it is the word of the Lord through the mouth of his servant Brigham and has been a long time the word of the Lord to me that as 12 apostles, as 70 apostles, as high priests and as elders of Israel, it is time that we should rise up and bear the burden that rests upon the shoulders of Brigham Young, who is far advanced in age and has had the weight and burden of this church and kingdom upon his shoulders. It is our duty to rise up and bear off this burden and lift it from our president. And also to cry aloud unto the people, to unite themselves together. It is our duty to cease shaking in our shoes for fear. For fear the Lord Almighty should give some of his word to govern and control us in our temporal affairs. Oh, please don't tell us what to do in our temporal affairs, right? Lord, just tell us what to do, spiritual things. Who, to use a comparison, expect to have a 40-acre lot alone in the kingdom of God? or in heaven when we get there. None need expect it, for in that kingdom, in heaven or upon earth, we shall find unity, and the Lord requires at our hands that we unite together according to the principles of his celestial law. Once again, what a golden quote here from, from Woodruff. Who expects to have a 40-acre lot alone in the kingdom of God or in heaven? 
none who go there will expect such a thing, for there shall be unity, a oneness required for the celestial kingdom. Oh, but my guy can live deliciously in Babylon, sitting on my millions in luxury and simply trade it in when the time comes. My heart isn't set on these things. Alma chapter 34. For behold, this life is a time for men to prepare to meet God. Yea, behold, the days of this life is the day for men to perform their labors. And now, as I said unto you before, as ye have had so many witnesses, therefore I beseech of you that you do not procrastinate the day of your repentance until the end. For after this day of life, which is given us to prepare for eternity, behold, if we do not improve our time while in this life, then cometh the night of darkness wherein there can be no labor performed. You cannot say when you are brought to that awful crisis that you will repent, that I will return to my God, that I will just hand over all my riches and estate. No, you cannot say this. For that same spirit which does possess your bodies at the time that you would go out of this life, that same spirit that, that self-justifies you holding on to all that unnecessary assets and, and you're, you're living deliciously now, that same spirit, it's the same spirit that will have power to possess your bodies in that eternal world. For behold, if you have procrastinated the day of your repentance, even until death or even until this moment, behold, you have become subject to the devil, the spirit of the devil, and he does seal you his. Isn't that interesting? Seal you his, right? We're trying to be sealed in our foreheads by the Lord or sealed by the sealed by the by Satan and ones that come down to it. it always comes down to these temporal things. Always comes down to these temporal things. He does seal you his. Therefore, the spirit of the Lord hath withdrawn from you and hath no place in you, and the devil hath all power over you. And this is the final state of the wicked. And once again, this was all temporal, remember? Because what? why were these sermons being given? Because people were being kicked out of the temples because they weren't wealthy enough. That was literally the context of this sermon. It was all temporal. And this I know because the Lord has said he dwells not in unholy temples. So it's okay. It's a really fancy beautiful temple but it's unholy so i'm not there but in the hearts of the righteous does he dwell yea and he has also said that the righteous shall sit down in his kingdom to go no more out but their garments shall be made white through the blood of the lamb and now my beloved brethren i desire that you should remember these things and that you should work out your salvation with fear before god and that you should no more deny the coming of christ that ye contend no more against the holy ghost but that ye receive it and take upon you the name of Christ, that you humble yourselves even to the dust and worship God. Humble yourself to the dust. Orson Pratt taught, now his will must be done on earth as it is in heaven. As it is done in heaven. In order that the prayer which has been offered up by his people ever since it was revealed may be fulfilled to the very letter. Hence the great necessity of the Latter-day Saints preparing themselves by being united even as the hosts of heaven are. For remember that the Apostle Paul says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in, in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth, even in him. If then the general assembly and church of the firstborn are to come down out of heaven to dwell on the earth, how important it is the Latter-day Saints should be prepared to join this grand company, being united as they are, having no feelings of dissension, no division in their midst, no evil or corruption of any nature, no covetousness, no feeling of individuality in regard to wealth, but having all upon the altar, ready to subserve the purposes of, of the Most High in building up his kingdom upon the earth. End quote from Orson Pratt. I believe that was Orson Pratt. That wasn't probably P. Pratt, was it? I hope I didn't write down the wrong name there when I copied that in. It was A. Pratt. Maybe I'll just play it safe here and just say Elder Pratt. Uh, Elder Pratt said that. I'm second guessing myself. This is what I consider to be the word of the Lord to us. It is our duty to unite ourselves together and to sustain the institutions which have been established in these mountains by the revelation of God unto us. There's another word of the Lord unto me and which has been like fire shut up in my bones for the last three months. That is to call upon all the inhabitants of these mountains as far as I have an opportunity 
to go to and lay up their grain that they may have bread. Do you know what? These are just such, like, he's gone right from one topic to the next, the next, fulfilling, fulfilling of prophecies. They're all going to be fulfilled. Oil in your lamps, directly to grain. It's just crazy to me. For the last three months, I have not felt at, as if I could answer my own feelings unless at every meeting I have attended, I called upon the farmers to lay up their grain. Oh, yes, say some. Heber C. Kimball cried famine, famine for years, and it has not come yet. Well, bless your soul, there is more room for it to come. Who am I, saith the Lord, that, that I promise and do not fulfill? The day will come when if this people do not lay up their bread, they will be sorry for it. The Lord has felt after us in days past and gone by the visitations of crickets and grasshoppers time after time. And had it not been for his mercy, we should have had famine upon our heads long before this. It is the duty of the farmers in these mountains not to sell their bread or to throw it away for a song, but to lay it up. Or you will find that the day is not a great way off when you will need it. This is really important because even if you die, you're going to need oil in your lamp. That is the voice of the Lord to me. And it is it is the way I have felt for a good while. And I believe it is the same to my brethren. I, I personally, I really don't know if you can get a more clear tie into the parable of the 10 virgins and the oil being grain than this talk. There's, there are a few, right? There's a few other times, right? As we all slumber and sleep, how many still have oil in their lamps as commanded by the Lord? How many are temporal, temporally prepared and can stand independent when this famine comes? How many know that a huge part of the Relief Society's entire purpose was this very thing, to stand independent in temporal things? Specifically, he mentions in the talk later, clothing. And we'll get into that, in fact, uh, shortly after this in the talk. But the question remains, how many of the virgins, meaning active, endowed, temple, recommend holding members, fulfill this mandate from the Lord? And how many are slaves living deliciously in Babylon while it lasts? Oh, that we would wake up and repent before it is everlastingly too late. I long for the day that I can meet with those saints who kept or kept oil in their lamps who kept their oil in their lamps their entire lives and died in the faith. For they shall too be in the procession to the wedding and only they of the dead. Those that died in the past that did not have oil in their lamps will not be in the procession. So you think, oh, well, what, what did it serve them to have that, that oil in their lamps and they died and they never got to see the famine? They will be a part of the procession. They will be a part of the wedding feast. Those that did not have oil in their lamps will not be there. Continuing here, we are living in a very important time, and the Lord has raised up this people to accomplish his purposes. And as some of these revelations convey the idea, they were chosen from before the foundation of the world. The Lord says, I've called you by, by my everlasting priesthood, and your lives have been hid with Christ in God, and you have not known it. You have been called here, and God has put into your hands his cause and kingdom and the salvation of both Jew and Gentile. This people hold in their hands the salvation of the 12 tribes of Israel. It was not to the oldest son, but to Ephraim, the son of Joseph, that these promises were made. Joseph was the youngest, but one of the 12 patriarchs. And through his son Ephraim, God has raised you up and has put this power into your hands, and you hold the key for the salvation of Israel. And the 10 tribes of Israel in the north country will come in remembrance before god in in due time meaning it hasn't happened yet and they all knew it <laughs> and they will smite the rocks and the mountains of ice will flow down before them and the everlasting hills will tremble at their presence a highway will be cast up through the midst of the great deep for them to come to zion and they will bow down in the midst thereof and receive the priesthood at the hands of the inhabitants of zion now, I'm going to ask you to forgive me in indulging in reading these two long passages for far too few members of Christ's church today seem to know or care to know 
the doctrine on this. So I'll simply read the scriptures, a set of scriptures, and the church's own student manual. Let them speak for themselves here. Doctrine Covenants 133, which is what uh, Wolfrey Rodriguez was quoting here. And the Lord, even the Savior, shall stand in the midst of his people and shall reign over all flesh. And they who are in the north country shall come in remembrance before the Lord, and their prophets shall hear his voice, and shall no longer say themselves, and they shall smite the rocks, and the ice shall flow down at their presence. And an highway shall be cast up in the midst of the great deep, and their enemies shall become a prey unto them. And in the barren deserts there shall come forth pools of living water, and the parched ground shall no longer be a thirsty land. And they shall bring forth their rich treasures unto the children of Eve from my servants, and the boundaries of the everlasting hills shall tremble at their presence. And there they shall fall down and be crowned with glory, even in Zion, by the hands of the servants of the Lord, even the children of Ephraim. And they shall be filled with songs of everlasting joy. Behold, this is the blessing of the everlasting God upon the tribes of Israel and the richer blessings upon the head of Ephraim and his fellows. Okay. Now this is the, the thing from the student manual here. When the 10 tribes return, they will bring their rich treasures to the children of Ephraim. Part of this rich treasure will be the records which they have kept all these centuries. In them will be found the account of their miraculous escape from Assyria, their journey into the land of the north, their history, their prophets, and the appearance to them of the Savior after his resurrection. See Second Nephi, see Third Nephi, see Doctrine and Covenants 133. And this is from the student manual from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. In April Conference of 1916, Elder James E. Talmadge, a member of the Quorum of the Twelve, spoke of the Lost Tribes and their records. There's a tendency among men to explain away what they don't wish to understand in literal simplicity. And we as Latter-day Saints are not entirely free from the taint of that tendency. Some people say that prediction is to be explained in this way. A gathering is in progress and has been in progress from the early days of this church. And thus the Lost Tribes are now being gathered and that... We are not to look for the return of any body of people now unknown as to their whereabouts. True, the gathering is in progress. This is a gathering dispensation. But the prophecy stands that the tribes shall be brought forth from their hiding place. And their scripture shall become one with the scriptures of the Jews, the Holy Bible, and with the scriptures of the Nephites, the Book of Mormon, and with the scriptures of the Latter-day Saints as embodied in the volumes of modern revelation. Then, in October conference, Elder Talmadge spoke again of the Lost Tribes and made this remarkable prediction. The Ten Tribes shall come. They are not lost under the Lord. They shall be brought forth as hath been predicted. And I say unto you, there are those now living, I, some here present, who shall live to read the records of the Lost Tribes of Israel, which shall be made one with the record of the Jews or the Holy Bible and the record of the Nephites or the Book of Mormon, even as the Lord hath predicted. The ten tribes will re remain in the land of Zion among the tribe of Ephraim for some time. Elder Orson Pratt explained, how long will they who come from the north countries tarry in the heights of Zion? Some time. They've got to raise wheat, cultivate the grape, wine and oil, raise flocks and herds, and their souls will have to become as a watered garden. They will dwell in Zion a good while, and during that time there will be 12,000 chosen out of each of these ten tribes, besides 12,000 that will be chosen from Judah, Joseph, and the remaining tribes, 144,000 in all. Chosen for what? To be sealed in their foreheads. For what purpose? So that the power of death and pestilence and plague that will go forth in those days, sweeping over the nations of the earth, will have no power over them. These parties who are sealed in their foreheads will go forth among all people, nations, and tongues and gather up and hunt out the house of Israel, wherever they're scattered, and bring as many as they possibly can into the church of the firstborn, preparatory to the great day of the coming of the Lord. Great and dreadful day. 144,000 missionaries, quite a host. All this has got to take place. The 10 tribes, however, are to eventually receive their land inheritance with Judah and not with Ephraim. And there will come a time after they have received their priesthood blessing when they will go to Jerusalem. In that day will be fulfilled the statement of Jeremiah. In those days, the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel, and they shall come together out of the land of the north to the land, to the land that I have given for inheritance unto your fathers. So once again, people say, well, there are people like Elder uh, McConkie who have said that 
the ten, 10 tribes will return from the north to the land of Jerusalem. Yes, it's going to be fulfilled twice. Once to the new Jerusalem, once to Zion over here in America, and then eventually they're going to go and have the, the prophecies going to be fulfilled again when they travel from here to the old Jerusalem. Elder Orson Pratt stated further, by and by when all things are prepared, when the Jews have received their scourging and Jesus had descended upon the Mount of Olives, the 10 tribes will leave Zion and will go to Palestine to inherit the land that was given to their ancient fathers, and it will be divided amongst the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. They will go there to dwell in peace in their own land from that time until the earth shall pass away. But Zion, after their departure, will still remain upon the Western Hemisphere, and she will be crowned with glory as well as old Jerusalem. And as the psalmist David says... She will become the joy of the whole earth. Beautiful for situation is Mount Zion on the side to the north, the city of the great king. End quote from the Old Testament student manual. Thank you for bearing with me on that one. Just so clear. Um, I, you, you just can't get any clearer than that uh, student manual from the Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints. Now let's go back to the talk here. Then what manner of men ought we to be? We who have been ordained and called and had such responsibilities placed upon us by the God of heaven. Our lives have been hid with Christ in God, and we are heirs of the eternal priesthood. I should also people should know that this choice of language is identical to the choice of language used to describe Joseph Smith being hid under the shadow of his hand, that holding the priesthood to be to come forth and arise at this time as well. Just so people are, are aware of that word association, if they're not already, um, through the lineage of our fathers. Thus saith the Lord through the mouth of the prophet Joseph Smith who sealed his test, and then and I want you to have that connection because he immediately ties it to Joseph Smith, okay? Thus saith the Lord through the mouth of the prophet Joseph Smith, who sealed his testimony with his blood, and his testimony from that hour has been enforced upon all the world. Know ye, Latter-day Saints, that the Lord will not disappoint you or this generation with regard to the fulfillment of his promises, no matter whether they have been uttered by his own voice out of the heavens or by the ministration of angels or by the voice of his servants in the flesh, it is the same. And through and though the earth pass away, not one jot or tittle of his word will fall unfulfilled. Another one of those people always ask, like, where do where do we get these quotes about not one jot or tittle of his word being fulfilled? It's said everywhere, right? There is no there is no prophecy of scripture of any private interpretation. But holy men of old spoke as they were moved upon by the Holy Ghost, and their words will be fulfilled to the very letter. And it certainly is time that we prepare ourselves for that which is to come. Great things await this generation, both Zion and Babylon. All these revelations concerning the fall of Babylon will have their fulfillment. I just wanted to tag in here, Dr. Ingram's 101. Hear those words. Hear these words of the Savior in Doctrine Commons 101 and see if you can't understand what he's talking about, okay? They're one-to-one -one connections, same words. My indignation is soon to be poured out without measure upon all nations, and this will I do when the cup of their iniquity is full. We've heard that before, a lot in this talk. And in that day, all who are found upon the watchtower, or in other words, all men Israel shall be saved. Those who were warning, right? Raising the warning voice, speaking the words of the Lord. They that have been scattered shall be gathered. And all they who have mourned shall be comforted. And all they who have given their lives for my name's sake shall be crowned, including Joseph Smith. Once again, once again, has to be has to be here before these events. Yeah? Therefore, let your hearts be comforted concerning Zion. For all flesh is in mine hands. Be still and know that I'm God. Zion shall not be moved out of her place, notwithstanding her children are scattered. They that remain and are pure in heart shall return and come to their inheritances, they and their children. Now, sometimes I wonder here, is it talking about us and our children? Or is it talking about Orson Pratt? Is it talking about Brigham Young? Is it talking about Joseph Smith will return? Is it talking about them returning and they will gather their children, meaning us, and we will go together with songs of everlasting joy to build the waste places of Zion? I think you should go to Doctrine and Covenants 88 and read about the angels uh, crying through the mists of heaven and and that uh, procession. And maybe you'll get a little better idea of how this works out here. And all these things, the prophets might be fulfilled, right? There's your tie-in to what we're talking about here. 
that the the promises of the Lord are are true. And behold, there is none other place appointed than that which I've appointed. Follow the footnotes here. It takes you to um, Doctrine and Covenants where the Lord says that it is Jackson County, Missouri. Neither shall there be any other place appointed than that which I've appointed. He's not going to change his mind, so his promises on that are true. 45 years ago, in speaking to the church, the Lord said, You are clean, but not all, and I am not well pleased with any who are not clean, because all flesh is corrupted before my face, and darkness prevails among all nations of the earth. This causes silence to reign, and all eternity is pained. The angels of God are waiting to fulfill the great commandment given 45 years ago. You love, I just love how they know the scriptures and they know the prophecy so well that they're literally flowing from one macro last day timeline point to the next to the next. And I don't, if you don't know the macro last day timeline, you won't understand how he's literally, every one of these is a step, is a step, is a step. Talking about the angels next is just the natural, uh, the uh, natural order of events to talk about next. Um, to go and reap down the earth because of the wickedness of men, how do you think eternity feels today? This is how they felt uh, 40 years ago, uh, 45 years ago, and however long ago it was for us today. Why? There is more wickedness a thousand times over in the United States now than when that revelation was given. Really? So if, the, if there was more wickedness 45 years later to when this talk was given, imagine what it was like, what it is for us today, how close we are to the precipice, or have we already reached it? Okay. The whole earth is ripe in iniquity, and these inspired men, these elders of Israel, have been commanded of the Almighty to go forth and warn the world that their garments may be clear of the blood of all men, right? that they can be watchmen on the tower. I tell you that God will not disappoint Zion or Babylon, the heavens or the earth, in regard to the judgments which he has promised in these last days. But every one of them will have its fulfillment upon the heads of the children of men, and when they are fully ripened in iniquity— the nations of the earth will be swept away as with the besom of destruction. Now, I said we would get back to the ripe and iniquity or cup of iniquity being full. It was hit on above in the Doctrine and Covenants 101. But wait, there's more. Let's throw in these two, uh, two other ones here. So this one from Hugh Nibley. There comes a time when the general defilement of a society becomes so great that the rising generation is put under undue pressure and cannot be said to have a fair choice between the way of light and the way of darkness. When such a point is reached, the cup of iniquity is full, and the established order that has passed the point of no return and neither can nor will change its ways must be removed physically and forcibly, if necessary, from the earth, whether by war, plague, famine, or upheavals of nature, end quote, like the flood. Elder Ezra Daff Benson taught, we must love our young people, whether they are in righteousness or in error, in this we can give them a chance to discern and to learn. But we must also give them a fair choice. Today, many are not succeeding. Yes, there comes a time when the general defilement of a society becomes so great that the rising generation is put under undue pressure and cannot be said to have a fair choice between the way of light and the way of darkness. End quote, Elder Ezra Daff Benson. And Elder Ezra Daff Benson there quoted Hugh Nibley. So I think that's funny. There's also another uh, quote that would also tie in really well here, which is the quote from um, uh, Joseph Smith Jr. saying that these upheavals and, and hail and famine will sweep the wicked of this generation from off of this land, the land of North America, to prepare the way for the return of the 10 tribes. And that that quote would tie into um, the sweeping here said by uh um, Wilford Woodruff, and when that cup of iniquity is full. These two quotes that I just read above here from El Elder or Elder Dad Benson and, and, and Hugh Nibley, um, combined with the family proclamation, tie in that I made above with the, the President uh, Brigham Young, uh, uh, 60 to 75% of the church, should make the time period we are in crystal clear, right? We should know where we are. But if we are still unsure, let me make it clear as possible as I can. Okay. Dr. Romans 101. And while they were yet laying a foundation thereof, they began to say amongst themselves, what need hath my Lord of this tower? And consulted for a long time saying amongst themselves, what need is my Lord of this tower? Seeing this is a time of peace. Might none of this money be given to the exchangers? But there's no need of these things. And while they were at variance one with the other, they became very slothful and they hearkened not to the commandments of their Lord. 
And the enemy came by night and broke down the hedge. And the servants of the noblemen arose and were affrighted and fled. And the enemy destroyed their works and broke down the olive trees. What did the Lord say to that meek and humble man, the brother of Jared, thousands of years ago with regard to the land of America? A chosen land promised by old father Jacob to his sons. He said that no nation should ever occupy it unless the people thereof keep his commandments. And if they fail to do that, they should be cut off when they were ripened in iniquity or the cup of iniquity is full. The Lord has already swept away too many nations from this continent. Getting that sweeped there, right? That Joseph Smith quote would have been good here. Because they have not fulfilled his word spoken through that humble man. The Lord chooses the weak things of the world through which through which are not to bring to naught things which are things which are not to bring to naught things which are. And he will as surely perform his work in this age of the world as he has done in any other. That's faith as the brother Jared again. We need not fear man nor the wrath of man, but fear God who holds in his hands the destinies of all men. Before I close my remarks, I want to say a few words to our sisters and daughters in Zion, for I feel there are some words of the Lord to them. Isaiah 3. This is a time that the daughters of Zion should hearken to the words of the prophet of God, who has been set to lead us. I feel that it is time, 40 years after they were organized, that the female relief society should labor with all their might to carry out the object of their organization by the prophet Joseph Smith. You may ask, what was the object of that organization? I will say that in organizing these societies, there were several objects in view, some of which I will refer to before I get through. President Young has been calling upon you as one branch of the land of Zion to take hold and help to build it up. He desires that the sisters here in the land of Zion should govern and control the fashions of Zion. Instead of keeping to yourselves and imitating the fashions that have adorned Babylon, you should have independence enough to form your own. And those which are not comely and comfortable should be laid aside. I myself do not think it has been pleasing in the sight of God to see the manner in which the mothers and daughters in Zion for years past, and note the time frame this was given in, have been ready to adorn themselves with every fashion that Babylon has contrived and invented. I need not mention all these things, but I will mention two or three. For instance, how is it with regard to the headdress of the ladies? The Lord has given to women generally a fine head of hair, which we are told in the scriptures is the glory of the woman, and she should let the hair given unto her, unto her adorn her head without adding any foreign substance, as is now done, in order to imitate and follow after the fashions of the world. Again, just as quick as the daughters of Babylon extend their crinolines, crinolines, you're giggling, you know what that is? Ashley's like, I have a couple of those. No. Uh, uh, <laughs> no. Until they cannot move in a space less than six or eight feet wide in a couch, coach, coach, can't move in a coach, assembly room or anywhere else. Why the daughters of Zion must follow the same uncomely fashion but a fashion the reverse of this is now adopted. And at the present time, the daughters of Babylon wear their elastics so tight that they have not room left for locomotion when walking in the streets. And of course, the daughters of Zion must practice the same. And now see one of them dressed in the height of fashion, crossing the street, and a runaway team comes thundering along. What a position she is in. Why, the only way she can save her life is to lie down and roll across the street like a saw log. <laughs> Sorry, this is funny. All these fashions are uncomely comely and should be laid aside. The daughter's design should do better than to trail silks and satins in the mud when walking in the streets. The female release society should lay hold of and regulate these things and introduce fashions that are comely and comfortable. It is their duty to do it. Again, you can do a good deal in regard to maintaining the independence of Zion by going to and carrying out the counsel of President Young and raising your own silk for dresses, bonnets, trimmings, so that you're adorning maybe the workmanship of your own hands. 
and I, I've, I've gone way too long here, but I was going to post it a bunch of the, the scripture references, of the book of Mormon, about how the women toiled with their hands for silks and linens and how, how much they were responsible for this and how every time it mentions the people of God, every time it mentions them being dressed neat and comely and they didn't wear fancy clothing and, uh, and, and how we are commanded to stand independent of all creatures under heaven, right? That's one of the things we're supposed to do. And apparently that is one of the huge purposes of the Relief Society. The Relief Society provide relief in the form of temporal things, um, as once again, laid out in the Book of Mormon very, very, very clearly. And uh, so I think that's pretty amazing that we've we've gone so far away from, from what uh, the original purpose of, which once again, it, it all goes back to the same things, becoming one mind, one heart, one in temporal things, one in spiritual things, so that we can redeem Zion and build the new Jerusalem. That's what the purpose of the priesthood was. That was the purpose of the Relief Society. That was the purpose of all these things and, and how far we've we've uh, decided might not this money be spent and, and retreated from the tower. I felt as though I wanted to say so much with regard to our sisters in Zion, and, and so did I. We both ran out of time. President Young says, and I know it is the truth, that this is the best people on the face of the earth, but however good we may be, we should aim continually to improve and become better. Right? We know what the goal is that we're shooting for. We have obeyed a different law and gospel to what other people have obeyed, and we have a different kingdom in view. Right. That's why we're trying to be better. We don't we're not here for the celestial. We're not here for the terrestrial. We're here for the celestial. And our aim should be correspondingly higher before the Lord, our God. And we should govern and control ourselves accordingly. And I pray, God, my heavenly father, that his spirit may rest upon us and enable us to do so. Another word of the Lord to me is that it is the duty of these young men here in the land of Zion to take the daughters of Zion to wife and prepare tabernacles for the spirits of men which are the children of our Father in heaven. They are waiting for tabernacles. They are ordained to come here. And they ought to be born in the land of Zion instead of Babylon. If they're not born here, they're going to be born somewhere else. This is the duty of the young men in Zion. And when the daughters of Zion are asked by the young men to join with them in marriage, instead of asking, has this man, man a fine brick house, a span of fine horses and a fine carriage? They should ask, is he a man of God? Has he the spirit of God with him? Is he a Latter-day Saint? Does he pray? Has he got the spirit upon him to qualify him to build up the kingdom? If he has that, never mind the carriage and brick house. Take hold and unite yourselves together according to the law of God. Now, the doctrine on this and these what he's laying out here hasn't changed since the church was restored. I know it hurts people's feelings, and I know that the church's current policy seems to be be extra careful with certain groups of people's feelings while not giving a rip about others. I know, I know. So with that said, I will simply read two quotes and move forward. Okay, move forward and let's end this talk. Let the Holy Ghost work on whoever it may. The first one I just want to simply read is the family proclamation of the world. We, the first presidency and council of the twelve apostles of the church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints, solemnly proclaim that marriage between a man and a woman is ordained of God and that the family is central to the creator's plan for eternal, for the eternal destiny of his children. End quote. Second one is uh, a quote from President Spencer W. Kimball that he gave as uh, president of the church, right? Which, right, he is a judge in Israel. He is the judge in Israel, okay? And he was also found in the Young Women's uh, Teaching Manual back when we had those. He said the following, President Spencer W. Kimball. He said, a few years ago, a, a young couple who lived in northern Utah came to Salt Lake City for their marriage. They did not want to bother with a temple marriage, or perhaps they did not feel worthy. At any rate, they had a civil marriage, after the marriage, they got into their automobile and drove north to their home for a wedding reception. On their way home, they had an accident, and when the wreckage was cleared, there was a dead man and a dead young woman. They had been married only an hour or two. Their marriage was ended. They thought they loved each other. They wanted to live together forever, but they did not live the commandments that would make that possible. So death came in and closed that career. They may have been good young people, I don't know, but they will be angels in heaven if they are. They will not be gods and goddesses and priests and priestesses because they do not fulfill the commandments 
and do the things which that were required at their hands. Sometimes we have people who say, oh, someday I will go to the temple, but I am not quite ready yet. And if I die, somebody can do the work for me in the temple. And that should be made very clear to all of us. The temples are for the living and for the dead only when the work could not have been done. Do you think that the Lord will be mocked and give to this young couple who ignored him? Give them the blessings? The Lord said, for all contracts that are not made unto this end have an end when men are dead. End quote. From President Spencer W. Kimball. And I could provide a bunch more, but I won't. Now let's end, let's end and wrap this up. We're wrapping up the end here. I rejoice to see the population increasing in the land of Zion. Why is it that 99 women out of every 100 over the whole land of Zion who are of proper age and married are bringing forth posterity until our children swarm in our streets almost like bees because the God of heaven is raising up a royal priesthood and a generation to bear off this kingdom in the day when his judgments will come upon the earth. Let us do our duty. Let us cease setting our hearts upon the fashions and things of this world and laboring to enrich ourselves at the sacrifice of the kingdom of God. We have a cooperative mercantile institution, and it is the duty of these Latter-day Saints to sustain and uphold it. And so with everything else that is in the kingdom, for these are the stepping stones to us to, fulfill, to a fullness of the celestial kingdom of God. I love how he says that they are then at that time raising up the generation of royal priesthood, which will be there when the Lord sends his judgments upon the world, i.e. the redemption of Zion and building a new Jerusalem. He's talking about that. So let's, I just wanted to read some of these quotes here in, uh, 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 in years. This one actually was 1877. Lorenzo Snow in 1877 said, I assure you we will never go back to Jackson County, Missouri, there to build up the new Jerusalem of the latter days until there's a perfect willingness on our part to conform to its rules and principles. Many years have transpired since we received the revelation of the United Order, and in one sense that long period of time bespeaks negligence on our part in not more fully obeying it. In 1974, Russell M. Nelson said the following, our duty is to rise up raise up a generation of men and women worthy to receive the coming of our Lord, for he will come to Jackson County, Missouri to be sustained as King of Kings, and he will come also to Israel to be hailed as Lord of Lords. Then his millennial reign will be ushered in. Well, the Bruce of said, there is no occasion for uncertainty or anxiety about the building up of Zion. And by the way, this quote also appears in the Latter-day Saint student manual as well, meaning the new Jerusalem in the last days. The Lord once offered his people the chance to build that Zion from which the law shall go forth to all the world. They failed. Why? Because they were unprepared and unworthy, as is yet the case with those of us who now comprise the kingdom. When we as a people are prepared and worthy, the Lord will again command us and the work will go forward on schedule before the second coming and at the direction of the president of the church. Until then, None of us need take any personal steps towards gathering in Missouri or preparing for a land of inheritance there. Let us rather learn the great concepts involved and make ourselves worthy for any work the Lord may lay up, lay upon us in our day and time. Some things must yet precede the building up of Jackson County. End quote from other Bruce McConkie, including the return of Joseph Smith. <laughs> President Benson said in 1989, my dear brethren and sisters, we must prepare to redeem Zion. It was essentially the sin of pride that kept us from establishing Zion in the days of the prophet Joseph Smith. It was the same sin of pride that brought the brought consecration to an end among the Nephites. Pride is the great stumbling block to Zion. I repeat, pride is a great stumbling block to Zion. We must cleanse the inner vessel by conquering pride. End quote from President Benson. How many people, man, especially the older generation, love this talk, wear pride from President Benson and, and omit the entire reason for the talk, right? So it's like, giving a talk about how to build an engine so that you could finish your car so that we could drive a car and only being fascinated with the engine and being like, yeah, but the, the whole purpose was the car. Ah, oh, we don't need to worry about the car. It's like the whole purpose of this talk was we have to prepare to redeem Zion. And what's holding us back right now is pride. 
and and we just omit the eye ah, yeah, well, there is no such thing as a redemption of zion and building a new, new jerusalem back in 1989 once again it was uh crystal clear right the the, the timing of all these russell m russell m nelson in october 2022 said one crucial element of this gathering is preparing a people who are able, ready, and worthy to receive the Lord when he comes again. A people who have already chosen Jesus Christ over this fallen world. A people who rejoice in their agency to live the higher, holier laws of Jesus Christ. Now, what you'll notice about most of these other quotes in the past, it's talking about raising up a generation, raising up a generation, raising up a generation. But President Nelson now in October, 22, October 2022 says, I call upon you. You alive right now, my dear brothers and sisters, to become this righteous people. Time's up. Time to awaken, arise, become this people. This is the time. It's a now or never, right? This is the hinge point. Okay, let's finish up the talk. Okay, I thank God that I live in this day and age of the world. And you know what? I, we thank God that we live in this day and age as well. What a what an amazing time. When my ears have heard the sound of the fullness of the gospel of Christ. I thank God that I've seen the face of the prophets, apostles, and inspired men. I rejoice in this, and I pray, God, my Heavenly Father, that I and my brethren and sisters may have power to unite and take hold and build up this kingdom. When we do this, it will not be in the power of power of earth or hell to take away our rights and privileges. For I tell you that if this people were united according to the law of God, what we're just talking about here, the, the higher, holier laws, the celestial kingdom, the celestial laws, wherein we should become fully justified before the Lord, sinners in Zion would tremble and fearful, fear, uh, fearfulness would surpass, surprise the hypocrite. The power of God would rest upon Zion. The angels of God would visit the earth. The judgments of God would be poured out upon the wicked. The Zion of God would be redeemed. The temples of God would be reared. The prison doors would be opened and the prisoners in the spirit word world would go free because we would feel the spirit and power of our missions and calling and should fulfill it. And what an awesome man. What an awesome quote here. That's uh, just gold. It says a macro lasting timeline, man. He just nailed it. I pray that God will bless his people and that he will bless president young who has already outlived four of his counselors. The Lord says, I will take whom I will take and I will preserve whom I'll preserve all these counselors were younger men than President Young, yet he has outlived them. God has ordained President Young to live, and he has lived so long and has had the prayers of hundreds and thousands of saints which have entered into the ears of the Lord of the Sabbath for his preservation. And the Lord has heard and answered these prayers. Let us as elders of Israel rise up, bear off this kingdom. Let us forsake our evils and wickedness and repent of our sins. And renew our covenants and keep the commandments of God that we may lighten the burdens of our president, that his spirit may be cheered and that the power of God may attend him in his labors for the advancement of Zion upon the earth. This is my prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Wilford Woodruff. And that ends uh, the talk and our thoughts on it. Now we're going to pass it over to Antonia. She's going to share with us her thoughts as uh, she studied this and uh, looked over this. Hi, Micah. Hey. <laughs> we were getting a note in here. <laughs> I'm in Colorado right now visiting Aaron and the kids. And so I'm glad I was able to um, come on. And I'm just going to share some amazing talk here that he had as so many things. And thank you so much for that breakdown that you did. Um, I just wanted to hit on a couple of, of, of sections that... Um, that came to you know my heart and uh, my mind as I as I read through this and um, and uh, just outlined some things that just um, I felt important to to share in in the beginning section where he talks about the resurrection it made me think about President Nelson and what he has said and our recent you know uh, uh, conference talk or uh, women's uh, conference that we just had recently and how important um, we are as a church. Uh, President Nelson said in, in October of 2018, he says, if you think the church has been fully restored, you're just seeing the beginning. There is much more to come. Wait till next year and then the next year. Eat your vitamin pills. Get your rest. It's going to be exciting. And we are uh, living during exciting times. I mean, we're seeing the deterioration of our country and, and a lot of things that are going on in the world. 
that uh, the saints they have peace as the saints that that um, lived during the time of Woodrow, Wil Wil uh, Woodruff, and um, because uh, we have these uh, blessings and promises. The Prophet Joseph Smith in uh, the teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith on page 62, he says, these are the blessings that come uh, to the faithful or for the faithful, which is the resurrection. It may be proper for us to notice in this place a, a few things of many blessings held out in this law of heaven as a reward to those who obey its teachings. God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world and this he has given as an assurance of in that he raised up his son Jesus Christ from the dead. The point on which the hope of all who believe the inspired record is found for their future happiness and enjoyment because if Christ be not raised, said Paul to the Corinthians, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins, then they also which have fallen asleep in Christ are perished. <clears throat> if the resurrection from the dead be not an important point or an item of our faith, we must confess that we know nothing about it. For if there be no resurrection from the dead, then Christ has not risen. And if Christ has not risen, he was not the Son of God. And if he was not the Son of God, there is not, nor can be a Son of God. If the present book called the Scriptures is true, because the time has gone by when, according to that book, he was made, he was to make his appearance. On this subject, however, we are reminded of the words of Peter to the Jewish Sanhedrin when speaking of Christ. He said that God raised him from the dead. I'm catching up to your scrolling. Uh, from the dead, and we the apostles are his witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Ghost whom God has given to them that obey him. That's from Acts 5. So that after the testimony of the scriptures on this point, the assurance is given by the Holy Ghost bearing witness to those who obey him. That Christ himself has assuredly risen from the dead. And if he has risen from the dead, he will by his power bring all men to stand before him. For if he has not risen from the dead, the bands of the temporal death are broken, that the grave has no victory then. If then the grave has no victory those who keep the sayings of Jesus and obey his teachings have not only a promise of a resurrection from the dead, but an assurance of being admitted into his glorious kingdom. For he himself says, where I am, there shall also my servant be. Also from the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith on page 84, he says, his resurrection from the dead, this resurrection I understand to be of the corporal body, yea, and also the resurrection of all men, righteousness and truth will I cause to sweep the earth as with a flood to gather out mine own elect from the four quarters of the earth unto a place which I shall prepare, a holy city, that my people may gird up their loins and be looking forth for the time of, thy, of my coming. For there shall be my tabernacle and it shall be called the Zion, a new Jerusalem. The glorious resurrection. Now I understand by this quotation, that God clearly manifested to Enoch the redemption which he had, which he prepared by offering the Messiah as a lamb slain from before the foundation of the world and by virtue of the same. The glorious resurrection of the Savior and the resurrection of the human family, even a resurrection of their corporal bodies, is brought to pass. And also righteousness and truth are swept, are to sweep the earth as with a flood. And now I ask how righteousness and truth are going to sweep the earth as with a flood. I will answer, men and angels are to be co-workers in bringing to pass this great work, and Zion is to be prepared, even a new Jerusalem, for the elect that are to be gathered from the four, four quarters of the earth, and to be established a holy city, for the tabernacle of the Lord shall be with them. The future state of existence, it's a talk come from um, G.D. Watt. Um, and the remarks were, I'm sorry, this was reported by uh, G.D. Watt. I'm, I'm having difficulty seeing the, the, okay, the remarks are from President Brigham Young, and he made this in um, 1962 in, um, I believe it was a conference that he had. And he says, I think it has been taught by some that as we lay our bodies down, they shall so rise again in the resurrection with all the impediments and imperfections that they had here. 
and that if a wife does not love her husband in this state, she cannot love him in the next. This is not so. Those who attain the blessing of the first or celestial resurrection will be pure and holy and perfect in body. Every man and woman that reaches to this unspeakable attainment will be as beautiful as the angels that surround the throne of God. If you can, by faithfulness, in this life, obtain the right to come up in the morning of the resurrection, you need to entertain no fear that the wife will be dissatisfied with her husband or the husband with the wife. For those of the first resurrection will be free from the sin and from the consequence of the power of sin. This body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. And that's uh, referencing 1 Corinthians 15, 42 through 44. As we have borne the image of the earthly, and we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. God has done his part towards putting us in possession of celestial glory and happiness by providing the means whereby we may attain to it. And if ever we possess it, we must do so by conforming to the means provided. God has given the children of men dominion over the earth and over all things that pertain to it, and has commanded them to subdue it and to sanctify themselves before him, and also to sanctify and beautify the earth by their industry and by their wisdom and skill, which cometh from God. Learn, for instance, how to yoke together a pair of oxen, and how to manage and drive them across the plains, and how to get timber from the canyons, and how to make brick, and how to hew stone, and bring them into shape and position to please the eye and create comfort and happiness for the saints. These are some of the mysteries of the kingdom to receive the gospel and believe and enjoy it in the spirit in its simplest part of the work of the Latter-day Saint to have, to learn, and to perform. God has made the Lord of all things here below. God has made man Lord of all the things here below, and it is the labor of man to bring all things into subjection to God by first subjecting himself to the will of God and then subjecting all things over which he has control in their time and order the will of god is eternal life to his people and to all they control and all, to all they control may god bless you and amen now just a, a few uh, comments uh, to to those um points you know um as saints we have a the wonderful promise of the resurrection and our you know i want to bear my witness and testimony that as michael said earlier it's one thing to know of uh, Jesus Christ and to know of uh, his birth and his ministry and his resurrection. It's quite, quite another to know him and to know and have uh, been given a testimony through his spirit of these things that they are true. And that is um, only through the work as a disciple of the Lord, um, working through all of these trials of say, or obstacles that we have in this life but all subjecting them to the will of the father knowing that they're for our benefit is how we obtain those blessings not just by knowing of them the second thing that um, stood out to me in this talk a section which is where that the saints hold the keys of salvation for all israel and they're they're broken down um and not um, um in that in that section and um, he says, this is what I consider to be the word of the Lord to us. It is our duty to unite ourselves together and to sustain the institutions who have been established in these mountains by the revelations of God unto us. And there is another word of the Lord unto me, which, I, which has been like fire shut up in my bones for the last three months. That is to call upon the inhabitants of these mountains as far as I have an opportunity to go and lay up their grain that they may have bread. It is the duty of the farmers in these mountains not to sell their bread or to throw it away for a song, but to lay it, or if you will find the day it is not a great uh, way off when you will need um, need of it. That is the voice of the Lord to me, and it is the way I have felt for a good while, and I believe it the same to my brethren. We are living in a very important time, and the Lord has raised up this people to accomplish his purposes and as some of these revelations convey the idea, they were chosen from before the foundation of the world. The Lord says, I have called you by my everlasting priesthood, and your lives have been hid with Christ in God. 
and you have not known it. You have been called here and God has put in your hands his cause and his kingdom and the salvation of both Jew and Gentile. Know ye, Latter-day Saints, that the Lord will not disappoint you for this generation with regard to the fulfillment of his promises, no matter what they have been uttered by his own voice or by the heavens of the heavens, by the ministration of angels or by the voice of the servants of the flesh. flesh it is the same. And though the earth may pass away, not one jot or tittle, tittle of his word will be unfulfilled. There is no prophecy or scripture or of any private interpretation, but holy men of old spoke as they were moved upon the Holy Ghost and their words will be fulfilled to the very letter. And it certainly is and certainly is time that we prepare ourselves for that which is to come. Great things await this generation, both Zion and Babylon. And all these revelations concerning the fall of Babylon will have their fulfillment. In the Journal of Discourses, uh, George Q. Cannon uh, spoke of this that we are mixed with the wicked. The tares and the wheat grow together and will grow until the harvest. This seems to be designed in the providence of our Father, that the time will come when there will be a separation, a final separation of the righteous from the wicked, and that separation will be brought about by the exercise of the priesthood which God has bestowed. The priesthood will draw up from the earth the pure, the holy, the worthy. It will draw them up to the society of God. Everything that is not pure will be, let, be left behind. Then we will feel and know the value of that tie. By it, the man will draw his wives to him. By it, the father and mother will draw their children to them. By it, generation will be linked to generation until all will be united clear back to our father Adam, the father of the human race on the earth. All this will be accomplished by the power and authority of the priesthood. And then he says, do you understand then why the priesthood and son of God is hated? Why the lives of the servants of God are sought after? Why is it that they are sought to be imprisoned and ensnared in the various forms? It is because the adversary of the souls knows full well that if this priesthood remains on the earth, then farewell to his authority, farewell to his kingdom, farewell to the dominion that has exercised over the children of men. It cannot continue its existence. He knows that as well as we do. He understands it perfectly. Hence, he has ever sought to destroy from the face of the earth the men who have held the priesthood of the Son of God. He was not satisfied until the earth drank of the precious blood of the Savior of the world and the life of everyone who has held the priesthood and has exercised it from the days of the righteous, able down to the present time, uh, has been sought for a greater or less extent by the adversary of the souls. He has used men as his agents to accomplish this. He cannot himself come here and exercise his power in his own person because it was forbid him and his angels rebelled with him in consequence of their great transgression that they should have tabernacles of flesh. This was their punishment that they should not have tabernacles of flesh. But from the day he entered into the serpent in the, uh, into the serpent in the garden of Eden, to the present, he has sought through the agency of man or beast the lives of those who have held the priesthood. In this way, he has sought to exercise his power and authority among men. So my thoughts on that is that all the power lies therein in the priesthood, and only those that have and are pure that have that priesthood, and I'm talking male and female, and having um, the privilege of the priesthood. Here he clearly is saying that um, in order for us, I need to see my notes, in order for us to, to fulfill what he has um, called us here to do, which is uh, much of what we've learned temporally, what we should be doing, um, to build up the kingdom, um, it's not it's not being done in, in in the most part as as I've seen. I'm not a, been a member for very long. We're starting our tenth year as being members, and I don't see uh, very many members um, doing those things which the Lord has called us to do. Me and my husband have um, this last year uh, been working very dif uh, diligently in performing those things that we have found 
not because we were taught them, but because we've been seeking the knowledge. And as we seek the knowledge through his priesthood, we've learned those things that we should be doing, which is, you know, preparing temporally, whether we live to um, uh, 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 be partakers of it is, is irrelevant. Uh, we just know we're supposed to be doing it and we do it because we've been commanded to do it. And here again, the, he is uh, show, uh, telling us that we will need it in the future, whether it be me or my children or, or uh, specific people that he asks us to do. Um, it's a, it's, in, it's in, in, insignificant to me in the sense that we just need to do it. Um, hopefully we'll be, uh, we'll have everything that we need to have when, when that time is, is, um, called upon us. But unless we have the priesthood to know which those things are, um, they're useless. All of these things are useless. And, um, so those were my thoughts, or at least the things that came to my thought when, um, I reviewed this, um, this, um, uh, this talk by, um, President Woodruff. Perfect. Thank you so much, Antonia, for coming on and sharing those thoughts. They're great. Um, there are some people talking about making soap in the chat, and I thought of you because you I know that you make some really nice soaps. So maybe you could um, share with the group how you make your soap. That would be interesting <laughs> to some people. But thanks again and travel safely. And we will now pass it over to Sheila to share her thoughts. Hi, Ashley. Oh, thank you so much. All of what's been shared has been exceptional. And um, there was a lot in this talk. I don't know if you can hear me. I hope that you can. Antonia and I are not very far apart because I'm actually in Colorado right now. Also, she's maybe I'm thinking only 30 minutes away from me having us traveled from Kentucky and um, her not being from Colorado. So we're joining tonight this way. Um, but uh, regarding Wilford Woodruff and his concerns for famine, um, the, there was there was so many, many scriptures. I, I think I had like 19 pages and then we got stuck in kind of this bad weather. And so I was trying to cut things out. And um, one of the things that I would invite everyone to do is to go into third Nephi because chapters two through five are so good. And while Micah was sharing his portion and Antonia was sharing her portion and I was um, listening to what they were saying, I felt like I really just want to read these scriptures. Um, and uh, they're in third Nephi. Um, but because I put this part up here, hopefully that you guys will all forgive me because I'm going to read from the Book of Mormon. It says chapter three in third Nephi chapter three, uh, the um the sub or the chapter heading it says Gideon High, the Gadianton leader, demands that Laconius and the Nephites surrender themselves in their lands. And so um if I go um here and I'll I'll add these parts to my portion. It says in verse 12 through um 16, it says, Now behold, this Laconius, the governor, was a just man and could not be frightened by the demands and the threatenings of a robber. Therefore, he did not hearken to the epistle of Gideon High, the governor of the robbers, but he did cause that his people should cry unto the Lord for strength against the time that the robbers should come down against them. Yea, he sent a proclamation among all the people that they should gather together their women and their children, their flocks and their herds, and all their substance, save it were their land, unto one place. And he caused that fortifications should be built round about them, and the strength thereof should be exceedingly great. And he caused that armies, both of the ne Nephites and of the Lamanites, or of all them who were numbered among the Nephites, should be placed as guards round about to watch them and to guard them from robbers day and night. Yea, he said unto them, As the Lord liveth, except you repent of all your iniquities and cry unto the Lord, you will in no wise be delivered out of the hands of those Gadianton robbers. And so great and marvelous were the words and prophecies of Laconius that they did cause fear to come upon all the people, and they did exert themselves in their might to do it according to the words of Laconius. And so then the Gadianton robbers, they tried to lay siege against the Nephites. In Third Nephi chapter 4, 3 through 4, it says, And the robbers could not exist, save it were in the wilderness, for the want of food. For the Nephites had left their lands desolate, and had gathered their flocks and their herds and all their substance, and they were in one body. 
Therefore, there was no chance for the robbers to plunder and to obtain food, save it were to come up in open battle against the Nephites. And the Nephites being in one body and having so great a number and having reserved for themselves provisions and horses and cattle and flocks of every kind that they might subsist for the space of seven years, in the which time they did hope to destroy the robbers from off the face of the land and, left, and thus the 18th year did pass away. Then in 3 Nephi chapter 4, verses 17 through 20, it says, Now they had appointed unto themselves another leader whose name was Zemnariha. Um, therefore, because the original leader died in battle uh, of the bad guys of Gadiant to robbers, it says, Therefore it was Zemnariha that it caused that this siege should take place. But behold, this was an advantage to the Nephites, for it was impossible for the robbers to lay siege sufficiently long to have any effect upon the Nephites because of their much provision, which they had laid up in store. And because of the scantiness of provisions among the robbers, for behold, they had nothing, save it were meat for their substance, which meat they did obtain in the wilderness. And it came to pass that the wild game became scarce in the wilderness, insomuch the, that the robbers were about to perish with hunger. So after the robbers, they finally, the only option they had was to come up against the Nephites. And the Nephites were delivered in this great battle. In 3 Nephi 4, 31 through 33, it says, And it came to pass that they did break forth all as one in singing and praising their God for the great thing which he had done for them, in preserving them from falling into the hands of their enemies. Yea, they did cry, Hosanna to the Most High God. And they did cry, Blessed be the name of the Lord God Almighty, the Most High God. And their hearts were swollen with joy unto the gush out of many tears because of the great goodness of God in delivering them out of the hands of their enemies. And they knew it was because of their repentance and their humility that they had been delivered from an everlasting destruction. So that was the, um, the side bit that I wanted to add in there because it is so good. The people, Laconius, um, he taught his people and in response, his people were obedient. They weren't able just to just summon up seven years worth of provisions. It was something that they had been doing and had been obedient to Laconius in doing so for a long time, that then when they were called upon that they had to gather together as a people um, with all their provisions that they were able to last for seven years. And that's the power of obedience. That's the power of, of following um, the priesthood keys. So um, there's a scripture that also comes to mind um, that I, I will write up, I'll, I'll add into here. Um, and I'm going to take a little bit of liberty with it, but at second Nephi 28, seven, it says, yea, and there shall be many which shall say, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow. We waltz into Zion and it shall be well with us. And I know that that is, uh, the feelings of many saints and that they either don't believe that Zion will be built or that Zion is in Salt Lake city, or that when Zion will be built, that it will be okay, that, that we're all just going to just waltz into Zion together. So I just I really wanted to add those verses in there and to encourage each of us just to keep being obedient to the keys, uh, keep preparing, keep doing the things the Lord has asked us to do. Um, but now going on to this, this second, second section that I wrote, I labeled it, it is time for Zion to rise and let her light shine. So Wilford Woodruff's wrote, words on page 127, um, site A, it says, it is our duty to rise up and bear off this burden and lift it from our president and also to cry aloud unto the people to unite themselves together. It is our duty to cease shaking in our shoes for fear the Lord Almighty should give some of his words to govern and control us in our temporal affairs. In heaven or upon earth, we shall find unity and the Lord requires at our hands that we unite together according to the principles of his celestial law. So, um, and people have mentioned that when the prophet urged, when the prophet in first presence, he urged us to get the vaccine, but they didn't feel like it was the the prophet's place to um, counsel in something that is is temporal. And so um, he should, and he does. DNC 105 for us. Um, let's see here. Oh, yeah. DNC um, section 105 verses two through, I think, six or seven, but I highlighted verse four. It says, behold, I say unto you, were it not for the transgressions of my people speaking concerning the church and not individuals, they might have been redeemed even now. But behold, they have not learned to be obedient to the things which I required at their hands. 
but are full of all manner of evil and do not impart of their substance as become a saints to the poor and afflicted among them and are not united according to the union required by the law of the celestial kingdom. And Zion cannot be built up unless it is by the principles of the law of the celestial kingdom. Otherwise, I cannot receive her unto myself. And my people must needs be chastened until they learn obedience, if it must needs be by the things which they suffer." And I would rather be obedient than suffer. So there are many small and simple ways that we can help to bear the burden that the prophet carries. A straightforward way is to keep our covenants with all honesty and full purpose of heart. In DNC 38, 10 through 12, it says, Verily I say unto you, ye are clean, but not all, and there is none else with whom I am well pleased. For all flesh is corrupted before me, and the powers of darkness prevail upon the earth among the children of men in the presence of all the hosts of heaven which causeth silence to reign and all eternity is pained and the angels are waiting the great command to reap down the earth to gather the tares that they may be burned and behold the enemy is combined dnc 11 or 1 12 33 verily i say unto you behold how great is your calling cleanse your hearts and your garments lest the blood of this generation be required at your hands so I connect that then to this other section that um, Wilfred Woodruff commented in the same discourse, and it's the portion on the sisters in Zion. It says, this is the time that the daughters of Zion should hearken to the words of the prophet of God who has been set to lead us. Um, I feel that it is time 40 years after they were organized that the female relief society should labor with all their might to carry out the object of their organization by the prophet Joseph Smith. You may ask, what was the object of that organization? I will say that in organizing these societies, there were several objects in view, some of which I refer to before I get through. President Young has been calling upon you as one branch of the land of Zion to take hold and help to build it up. He desires that the sisters here in the land of Zion should govern and control the fashions of Zion. Instead of heaping to yourselves and imitating the fashions that have adorned Babylon, you should have independence enough to form your own, and those which are not commonly and comfortable should be laid aside. I myself do not think it is it has been pleasing in the sight of God to see the manner in which the mothers and daughters in Zion for years past have been ready to adorn themselves with every fashion that Babylon has contrived and invented." Um, one thing I wanted to add here is, is just to invite anyone who's listening to read the saints, the history that the, the church has published, because you'll see um, as the mothers and daughters picked up the fashions of Babylon that they put off uh, the gospel. And um, it's exceedingly sad because they many of them walked across the plains and gave up so much. And then they turned. Um, and that turning began with their turning towards the fashion of Babylon. So all these fashions are uncommonly and should be laid aside. The daughters of Zion should do better than to trail silks and satins in the mud when walking in the street. I felt as though I wanted to say so much with regard to our sisters in Zion. President Young says, and I know it is the truth, that this is the best people on the face of the earth. But however good we may be, we should aim continually to improve and become better. We have obeyed a different law and gospel to what other people have obeyed, and we have a different kingdom in view. And our aim should be correspondingly higher before the Lord our God, and we should govern and control ourselves accordingly. And I pray God, my Heavenly Father, that His Spirit may rest upon us and aim and enable us to do so. In DNC 42, 39 through 41, it says, For it shall come to pass that which I spake by the mouths of my prophets shall be fulfilled. For I will consecrate of the riches of those who embrace my gospel among the Gentiles unto the poor of my people who are of the house of Israel. And again, thou shalt not be proud in thy heart. Let all thy garments be plain and their beauty the beauty of the work of thine own hands. And let all things be done in cleanliness before me. I didn't add this comment here, but I was thinking this, that as we um, try to, I guess, keep up with the trends of Babylon, it is it can be very expensive. I've I've seen what people have paid for for clothing and that uh, that money, um, although we do need to be dressed, of course. But but if we're being extreme in our expenditures, that money that could go to helping the poor and the needy is being spent on another set of shoes or or pants or shirts or whatever it may be. So DNC um, 3, 6 through 8, it says, And behold, how oft you have transgressed the commandments and the laws of God and have gone on in the persuasions of men. For behold, you should not have feared man more than God, although men set at naught the counsels of God and despised his words. Yet you should have been faithful, and he would have extended his arm and supported you against all the fiery darts of the adversary, and he would have been with you in every time of trouble. This uh, this is the counsel 
um, Ashley, can you scroll it back down for me just a, just a little bit? Because this counsel actually was given to Joseph Smith. Um, and when he was um, asking God to be able to believe to give Martin Harris the the words, but um, this can be a direction to us that if we try to align ourselves with the fashion of Babylon, we're fearing man more than God and not just dressing uh, simple and uh, being clean and, and comely. So um, setting our hearts straight is the, uh, the um, I guess, title of the next section. Wilford Woodruff that I gave it. Um, Wilford Woodruff in the same journal of discourse, he says, let us do our duty. Let us cease setting our heart, hearts upon the fashions and things of this world and laboring to enrich ourselves at the sacrifice of the kingdom of God. We have a co cooperative mercantile institution, and it, it is the duty of these Latter-day Saints to sustain and uphold it. And so with everything else that is in the kingdom, for these are the stepping stones to us, to a fullness of the celestial kingdom of God. The earlier sisters in Zion were perhaps blessed that when Wilfred Woodruff spoke, his counsel modesty was still in. Sisters in Zion now entrap their standards in the low and tight cuts of today. It's not uncommon for active sisters to find many occasions when they can't wear their garments for various activities of life. And adjusting our garments to fit the world's style and trends or not wearing them reflects an outward expression of the inward state of our testimony and faith. So in the topics and questions guide of the Church of Jesus Christ org website under overview garments, it says adult members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints who receive the endowment enter into sacred promises known as covenants to follow the highest standards of moral integrity and dedication to God. As part of entering into these covenants in the temple, members receive a simple undergarment, often referred to as the temple garment or garment of the holy priesthood. Unlike other ceremonial clothing used during the endowment, the garment is worn underneath members' normal clothing for the rest of their lives, serving as a daily physical reminder of their covenant relationship with God. In ancient times, the Lord commanded the prophet Moses to make special clothing for his brother Aaron and others who would officiate in the tabernacle. Thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother for glory and for beauty, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. This included clothing that was visible to an observer and clothing worn underneath these outer layers. In our day, the garment encourages modesty, but its significance is much deeper. For church members who have received the endowment, the garment reminds them of their connection to God, their commitment to follow his will, and the blessings and protection God has promised them faithful. The First Presidency of the Church has stated that how the garment is worn is an outward expression of an inward commitment to follow the Savior. Um, and when I was reading the saints, the, the history, it, it was um, surprising to me. I, I mentioned this earlier, but it was surprising to me that as the mothers and daughters um, sought the fashions of what was the current trend in these different places that it separated them from the gospel and not that we can't have a particular, um, I guess, uh, some people maybe want to wear t-shirts and others button up, not that we can't have those own personal preferences, but we, we know them when we've, we've stepped into just desiring the things of Babylon, Moses 5, 18 through 21. Um, and Cain loved Satan. Wait, I'm sorry. I think I forgot to read this. Wearing the temple garment is part of the covenant we make with God, a small and simple expression of our faith and commitments, an offering of sorts that we make daily, along with our broken hearts and contrite spirits. So Moses 5, 18 through 21, it says, And Cain loved Satan more than God, and Satan commanded him, saying, Make an offering unto the Lord. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock, and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. Now Satan knew this, and it pleased him, and Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. So as we were studying the sacrament um, in as Joseph's voice, I began to see how the alternate offering Cain made to Heavenly Father and expected God to accept is replicated in how we approach the wearing of our temple garments and how um, and can be a great stumbling block we trip over in our own lives if we aren't careful. So um, if we believe that we can adjust the garments and that's our, you know, that's that's okay. This is our how we're gonna wear them, um, then it's it's 
just the same as how Cain thought he could bring a different offering to the Lord and the Lord would have to be accepting of it. So these seemingly small adjustments being made by the daughters and sons of God create a rift, which unless speedily repaired continues to unravel the thread of devotion in many areas of their lives until they sit threadbare and naked of the gospel of Jesus Christ. DNC 3 um, one through four, it says the works and the designs and purposes of God cannot be frustrated. Neither can they come to naught. for God doth not walk in crooked paths. Neither doth he turn to the right hand nor to the left. Neither doth he vary from that which he has said. Therefore, his paths are straight and his course is one eternal round. Remember, remember that it is not the work of God that is frustrated, but the work of men. For although a man may have many revelations and have power to do many mighty works, yet if he boasts in his own strength and sets at naught the counsels of God and follows after the dictates of his own will and carnal desires, he must fall and incur the vengeance of a just God upon him. Revelations 3, 15 through 21, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I spew thee out of my mouth, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thy eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see as many as i love i rebuke and chasten be zealous therefore and repent behold i stand at the door and knock if any man hear my voice and open the door i will come into him and will sup with him and he with me are the wearing of garments or not that or not that big of deal the scriptures teach us over and over how through small and simple things great things are brought to pass for good or ill first nephi uh 16 um, verse 10, 16, and 20, it says, And it came to pass that as my father arose in the morning and went forth to the tent door, to his great astonishment, he beheld upon the ground a wall, a round ball of curious workmanship, and it was of fine brass. And within the ball were two spindles, and the one pointed the way whither we should go in the wilderness. And we did follow the directions of the ball, which led us in the more fertile parts of the wilderness. And it came to pass that Laman and Lemuel and the sons of Ishmael did begin to murmur exceedingly because of their sufferings and afflictions in the wilderness. And also my father began to murmur against the Lord his God. Yea, and they were all exceedingly sorrowful, even that they did murmur against the Lord. So the companions of Nephi's group were divided in their response to the same events unfolding. One group showed faith, while the other group cast an attitude of murmuring. With what attitude are we wearing our garments? Are we putting off the fashions of Babylon to wear our sacred temple garments correctly? Are we mindful of the covenants we have made that allow us to wear these garments? Are we grateful for what has been done for us, that we have these holy symbols with us day and night? Or do we murmur and adjust, or murmur and forsake? In Alma 37, 38 through 46, it says, And now, my son, I have somewhat to say concerning the thing which our fathers call a ball or director, or our fathers called it Leahona, which is being interpreted a compass, and the Lord prepared it. And behold, there cannot any man work after the manner of so curious a workmanship. And behold, it was prepared to show unto our fathers the course which they should travel in the wilderness. And it did work according to their faith in God. Therefore, if they had faith to believe that God would cause that those spindles should point the way that they should go, behold, it was done. Therefore, they had this miracle and also many other miracles wrought by the power of God day by day. Nevertheless, because those mir miracles were worked by small means, it did show unto them marvelous works. They were slothful and forgot to exercise their faith and diligence, and then those marvelous works ceased, and they did not progress in their journey. Therefore, they tarried in the wilderness or did not travel a direct course and were afflicted with hunger and thirst because of their transgressions. And now, my son, I would that you should understand that these things are not without a shadow for as our fathers were slothful to give heed to this compass, now these things were temporal, they did not prosper. Even so, it is with things that are spiritual. For behold, it is as easy to give heed to the word of Christ, which will point you a straight course to eternal bliss, as it was for our fathers to give heed to this compass, which would point unto them a straight course to the promised land. And now I say, is there not a type in this thing? For just as surely as this director did bring our fathers by following its course to the promised land, shall the words of Christ, if we follow their course, carry us beyond the bell of sorrow into a far better land of promise. O oh, my son, do not let us be slothful because of the easiness of the way. For so it was with our fathers, for so was it prepared for them, that if they would look, that they might live. Even so it is with us. The way is prepared, and if we will look, we may live forever. So these these commandments that we've been given, they work by small means. Um, we act and great blessings are given to us, both for our, you know, our temporal prep, such as our food storage, and then also our covenants and the garments that we wear as a symbol of those covenants. 
Alma 37, 6 through 8, focusing on 7, it says, Now you may suppose that it is foolish, foolishness in me, but behold, I say unto you that by small and simple things are great things brought to pass, and small means in many instances doth confound the wise. And the Lord God doth work by means to bring about his great and eternal purposes, and by very small means the Lord doth confound the wise and bringeth about the salvation of many souls. And now it has hitherto been wisdom in God that these things should be preserved, for behold, they have enlarged the memory of this people, yea, and convinced many of the errors of their ways, and brought them to the knowledge of their God and to the salvation of their souls. So apathy or slothfulness leads to apathy. First Corinthians 2 14 it says, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually dis discerned, but we can counter that with, um, with these, I, I love this scripture, Romans 13, 11 through 12. It says, and that knowing the time that now it is not is high time to awake out of sleep for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed the night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. And I read that and um, made me feel even more grateful for my temple garments. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. So what are our hearts set on? Revelation 16, 15, it says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Revelations 3, 4 through 5, thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Revelations 3, 11, behold, I come quickly, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. And DNC 105, 1 through 5, Verily I say unto you who have assembled yourselves together, that ye may learn my will concerning the redemption of mine afflicted people. Behold, I say unto you, were it not for the transgression of my people, speaking concerning the church and not individuals, they might have been redeemed even now. But behold, they have not learned to be obedient in the things which I required at their hands, but are full of all manner of evil, and do not impart of their substance as become as saints to the poor and afflicted among them, and are not united according to the union required by the law of the celestial kingdom. And Zion cannot be built up unless it is by the principles of the law of the celestial kingdom. Otherwise, I cannot receive her unto myself. DNC uh, 6433, wherefore be not weary in well-doing, for ye are laying the foundation of a great work, and out of small things proceedeth that which is great. And then I just want to read kind of the highlighted bit here. Um, well, I'll just read it. It'll be easier than summing it up. We have been asked to prepare physically and spiritually in our day of imminent calamities. Elder Dallin H. Oaks of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught that we should do what we should do to prepare for the events that precede the Savior's coming. What if the day of his coming were tomorrow? If we knew that we would meet the Lord tomorrow through our premature death or his unexpected coming, what would we do today? What confessions would we make? What practices would we discontinue? And I would invite anyone who has set aside their garments or um, doesn't understand the sacredness of the temple garments and the strength that they, it can be to your life and to your testimony um, and to your growth to connect with your bishop or connect um, with a trusted friend and ask them to share their testimony on the sacred gov sacred temple garments. Um, what accounts we would settle, what forgivenesses we would extend, what testimonies we would we bear. If we would do those things then, why not now? Why not seek peace while peace can be obtained? If our lamps of preparation are drawn out, let us start immediately to replenish them. We need to be we need to make both temporal and spiritual preparation for the events prophesied at the time of the second coming. And the preparation most likely to be ne neglected is the one less visible and more difficult, the spiritual. Are we following the Lord's command? Stand ye in holy places and be not moved until the day of the Lord come. For behold, it cometh quickly. What are those holy places? Surely they include the temple and its covenants faithfully kept. Surely they include a home where children are treasured and parents are respected. Surely the holy places include our posts of duty assigned by priesthood authority, including missions and callings faithfully fulfilled in branches, wards, and stakes. And then one final note, as we seek to follow the Lord, we love, encourage, and lift those around us so that others will have a deeper desire to follow Christ and renew their vigor of keeping their covenants, wearing the temple garments, and casting off Babylon. I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
thank you so much, Sheila. That was really good. I really like that connection between the garments and and all that has been talked about uh, with Zion and keeping covenants and and preparing and getting our our lamps ready. So thank you so much for that. It was really good. So thank you everyone who joined the fireside this week. Uh, we appreciate all of you and all our volunteers every week. We love you all. Um, next week is the last conference talk from October. And then we'll be going into conference weekend, which is always fun. And so that last conference talk is, I think it was from Elder Costa. And it was called, let me see here. Yes, it is. Um, Elder Cost says the power of Jesus Christ in our lives every day. And that will be on Easter Sunday. So include us in your Easter plans because the fireside is always a good way to, to remember Christ. <laughs> so thank you all again. And we will see you guys next week. Have a good week. <laughs>